Hello brothers, sisters and friends. Welcome to the second part of my review of the Jehovah's Witness 2020 convention. So I reviewed the first part of the convention which was the morning, Friday morning and if you've not seen that then I will drop a link in the description box below so feel free to check that out. So what I've done is I've gone through the whole video and there's a lot to talk about, there really is. But what I've done and to save time is I've just cherry picked a few points that I really want to comment on. Okay guys, so the scene has been set. In the morning the witnesses were guilt tripped into feeling that they can't take promotion at work, they can't go out and earn extra income to provide for their families, that they need to do the bare minimum at work so th and earn the minimum amount of money for their families and even be prepared to go without. Okay, so essentially to live a life of poverty. So that was the dramatisation on Friday morning the scene has been set for the bullet to come and the bullet is here so check this out there is an ongoing need for volunteers at bethel and on theocratic construction projects are you interested in temporary or permanent service in these ways if so we encourage you to watch the video making yourself available for bethel service so this guy is now putting out a call for volunteers for Bethel and also the construction services. So again, really getting to the point. We don't want you working more than necessary in, the, in your secular jobs to provide for your families. We want you to do the absolute minimum so that you can come and work for us for free at Bethel and in our construction services. So at one point they were a publishing company, but now they're focusing their efforts on being a construction and property business. And they want their people to go and work there for free. So now that the scene has been set, they're going to guilt trip you even further. So they're going to do a Bible reading by Samuel Hurd, is a member of the governing body. And he's going to really reinforce a few points so that if you did if the guilt tripping didn't work, it's gonna the hit's gonna be turned up even further now. So let's watch a few clips from Samuel Heard. Serve Jehovah with rejoicing, says Psalm 100, verse 2. Yes, Jehovah wants us to be joyful, and he's given us many reasons to rejoice. He gave us life with his many joys. So, yes, here he's saying that God, Jehovah, or their God, Jehovah wants you to be joyful and he's given you many gifts including life and I just found that to be a bit insulting particularly as Jehovah's Witnesses do not value life in the sense that they will encourage their members to refuse a blood transfusion even if their life is in the balance and promote the fact that you know dying is better than having a blood transfusion yes jehovah is the god who gives joy so he's saying that jehovah is the god that gives joy and interestingly when i was a jehovah's witness my joy had gone my joy completely left me because there was nothing joyful about going out working for free voluntarily 90 hours a month every month selling magazines and books and religion on the doorstep peddling 
like an unpaid salesman and that is essentially what the organisation gets people to do. So there was very little joy there for me and I know a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses don't feel that joy. They are there to keep their families essentially and to please the organisation. Satan, however, does not want us to find joy in serving Jehovah. Why not? For one thing, he knows that joy helps us to keep on preaching and teaching the very work he wants to stop. So he tries to destroy our joy, sometimes through official opposition and at other times through family and community pressure. Now, as a woman, I find this particular scene particularly disturbing. You have a young woman with her, a young child, possibly her young daughter, and they're in a sparse rural community and they meet a mob of young men. But a, instead of these, this woman and this young girl going to safety, maybe going back home, the implication is that their joy is allow their joy allows them to continue in the preaching work even though we're surrounded by a group of men so the message that's coming across from this for me is that it doesn't matter even if you're in danger of being attacked or raped or even worse then be joyful that you're out there on the streets doing god's work Satan also wants us to cut back our service to Jehovah in order to obtain unnecessary material things. He wants us to think that getting more and more material things will bring us lasting joy. It won't. Satan's tactics are not new. So I find it really disturbing, the contrast, because you have a scene of a woman with a young girl out in service surrounded by a mob and they clearly are living in an underdeveloped country um, there's broken down houses in the background there's um, you know it's a very sparse underdeveloped community and then he jumps to a scene where you have a family that are living in wealth and can afford to go out shop and buy lots of um, goods, assuming the expensive goods, they look expensive from the packaging. Um, so he's making that contrast, which I just think is really unfair. So I just find the mind games is really interesting because it's not comparative you've got um a underdeveloped nation and then wealth in the west but yet using the same scenario the same words to imply that we mustn't pursue material things and it's the, the lack of material things especially in underdeveloped countries that keep people poor that keep them down that keep them living in poverty where they're not able to have running water uh, gas, electricity, all the utilities, and to have health care, etc. So it's really unfair comparison that he's making here. And he's making all of these comparisons whilst he's sitting in his luxury leather bound chair. That's probably cost him a pretty penny. And he's probably his Savile Row suit, top London designer made suit I don't see him sitting on you know a raggedy stool wearing raggedy clothes no it's okay for him to live in luxury and wear his fine clothes and sit in his luxury chair but yet his subjects people who are looking up to him no you must live in poverty so now he is going to do some Bible readings um, from a couple of Bible books. And again, I've just picked out a couple of things 
in these Bible readings that I want to share with you. We do not put our ultimate hope in any ruler or institution of this world. None of them can bring us permanent salvation. So, interesting words he says, that we don't put our faith and hope in any ruler or institution of this world. Now, isn't Jehovah's Witnesses the watchtower and the governing body and the organisation that they run? Isn't that an institution? So, I think their members need to listen to this point really carefully and not follow any man-made institution. In fact, before the end of Satan's system, all the nations will turn against Jehovah's people. I had a really interesting conversation with somebody the other day and um, they were saying that in their opinion, they believe Jehovah's Witnesses spend so much time out in field service and stood there, you know, with their magazines and on street corners and all of that. And the reason that they were doing that was that the more that they get knocked back, the more that people um, harass them and, and don't want to know and even be rude to them, is to reinforce the fact that they are the true religion and that they will be persecuted and that they are going to be turned on turned upon and i just thought that that was interesting and i've never even all the years that i was jehovah's witness i never ever ever thought about it like that and he was saying that you know the more that people are out there you know doing their preaching work it's the more chance that they're going to get despised and not back and all of that and every time that happens it strengthens them and reinforces them that they are the true religion because they believe that you know the bible teaches that in the last days they're going to be the nations are going to turn upon them and I just thought, yeah, I can see it. I never thought about it like that before. And that was an interesting point. First, Jehovah blesses our determined efforts to keep on doing his work despite challenges. But he frustrates the efforts of our opposers. So again, he goes back to this clip of this woman with this young child in an area where there's nobody else other than this mob of men. And again, trying to say that God's going to reward their efforts. Never mind that they're in danger. Never mind that, you know, their lives could be threatened. Never mind that they could be attacked, raped, whatever. Oh no, but God's going to bless your efforts for being out there. Crazy. Second, when we put Jehovah's work ahead of material comforts, he gives us true joy. Again, more propaganda saying that when we put God's work ahead of material comforts, it gives us true joy. I'd love to know. I'd love to know how he could sit there in his leather, luxury, comfortable chair with his tailored suit, all coordinated. How can he sit there and say that when a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses are living in poverty and i really made the point about that in part one um of the morning convention and my review which i've left a link in the video in the description box below if you've not seen that please watch that where i share how in my local area even here in england a lot of jehovah's witnesses are living in poverty because they take to heart what these governing body people are saying so again he comes back with this this ridiculous point but we really know what it's all about it's all about don't give your time to secular jobs work as little as as is necessary earn as little as necessary so that you can devote your time, the bulk of your time, to building our organisation, to working on our construction, so we can 
build and sell property and also we can keep our publishing company up and running so we can still make millions but for you the regular rank and file you need to know your place and you need to give be donating your time to us and don't forget any money that you earn as well i, I just think it's evil what's the work jesus commissioned us to do today he made it very clear in his parting words to his followers go therefore and make disciples of people of all the nations that's right jesus did say to his disciples and his followers to go and make disciples of other people he did say that but he didn't say put yourself in danger put your children in danger put your health at risk put your life at risk to do that he didn't say live in poverty he didn't say don't go and work he didn't say go knocking doors at all hours he didn't say go and stand on street corners like a spiritual prostitute and um, peddling your magazines and your books jesus didn't say any of that none of that he said go make disciples and there's numerous ways that you could make disciples of people you don't have to go knocking doors spending 90 hours a month or however hours it is now or living in poverty in order to do that are we with our hearts and hands putting this assignment ahead of material goals Haggai foretold that one day Jehovah's temple would become far more glorious than the one Solomon built. That prophecy is being fulfilled today. Jehovah is using our preaching to shake the nations. So he's making some really bold and substantiated statements here. He's saying that Jehovah is using the preaching work today to shake the nations. Where does it say that in the Bible? I don't recall reading the Bible. I know it's been a long time since I read the Bible, but I don't ever recall the Bible saying that Jehovah was going to use the preaching work to shake the nations. I think he made that up. Millions of precious things, new worshippers, are coming to him. These are joyfully flocking to the great spiritual temple, Jehovah's arrangement for worshiping him on the basis of Jesus' ransom sacrifice. Did you catch that, guys? He actually mentioned Jesus? On the basis of Jesus' ransom sacrifice. This is something new. They very rarely mention Jesus, so I'm really pleased to hear that he's actually mentioned Jesus and his ransom sacrifice. Now is not the time to focus our attention on paneled houses or on any other unnecessary pursuit. So again, this is the culture of Jehovah's Witnesses. They want to control your life. So they're telling the audience that now's not the time to focus on unnecessary pursuits and Jehovah's Witnesses have a long list of pursuits that they class as unnecessary and in the morning session in my first review they also class working and see working extra hours seeking promotion um in order to earn extra money to support your family that apparently is an unnecessary pursuit and in that dramatization the uh, guy Ben who the video was all about he was really guilt tripped into taking the promotion and in the end he didn't and he even said you know that they're just gonna have to wait a little bit longer to get the things that they they need and they'll just make do. So now we get into the next talk with Mark Sanderson, again, another member of the governing body. 
and this is such an interesting talk because it's talking about acts of salvation by Jehovah it's forgotten all about Jesus just when I thought they were starting to remember Jesus mm -mm. so check this out around the world people everywhere are looking for a savior they long for a savior who can rescue them from disease, from hunger, from poverty, from crime, from war, even from death. Well, in the midst of so many calamities and so many problems, why are Jehovah's people rejoicing? Because our magnificent, our almighty God Jehovah is that savior. We have him. And as a result, we feel joy in our hearts okay so he starts off by saying the people are looking for a savior and jehovah's people are rejoicing because they already have their savior not jesus though their savior isn't jesus their savior is jehovah okay so i'm a little confused because i thought that according to the bible and i'm not saying that i believe the bible i'm just saying that according to the bible i thought that that's why jesus came that jesus came and he died he was nailed to the torture stake according to jehovah's witnesses or to all other christians he was um crucified so that's why I thought Jesus died and I remember the Bible telling me that Jesus Christ is my saviour yeah maybe maybe I read that wrong because Mark Sanderson is is not saying that he's saying that Jehovah is the saviour hmm. the scriptures describe Jehovah as being a grand saviour come on mark sanderson come on you know better than that to try and pull the wool over our eyes you know that when you make these wild sweeping statements you usually are able to find a scripture that you can twist to prove your point but you're making this statement that jehovah is our grand savior now, where does it say that in the Bible? Somebody, please enlighten me. Tell me where in the Bible does it say that Jehovah is our grand saviour? Because I think he just made that up. I do know that the Bible says that Jesus is our saviour. I've never heard of Jehovah God being the grand saviour. We know it is a part of his personality, his identity, to want to rescue and save his faithful servants. So now, how should we feel about Jehovah's ability to save us, about his acts of salvation? Jehovah's acts of salvation? Hmm, I'm confused. Well... The psalmist said we want to rejoice in Jehovah's ability to save. And really, brothers, when we have a faith, a confidence that Jehovah wants to save us, that he has the ability to save us, and that he has ways and means to save us, this truly is a reason for us to rejoice. Now, this is, I'm on my soapbox again excuse me but i'm on my soapbox so one of the reasons when i left the cult when i escaped i kind of like really backed off from religion is because i found that religion and not just jehovah's witnesses i have to add because religion takes the concept of God and try and humanize him and I'm, I'm on my journey in the last couple of years to really try and understand God and try and 
really try and see and really understand where I am in terms of my faith and what I do know is that there is a higher power a much higher power and that is as far as I go at the moment but what people tend to do is take this higher power and give it a name and they give it a personality and usually those personalities are very humanistic so in my mind and I'm sure some of you will have a completely different view and perspective but I think that the minute that we start to put a humanistic personality on the almighty on the creator on the all powerful the, the, the divine um, once we start doing that then I think that's when we have this layer of religion of what God likes what pleases God what displeases him and all of that is now religion and that takes away from the true nature of who and what God is and what he's all about so yeah I just found that interesting that it's sort of humanizing God and you know what the reality is that might be the God that Watchtower serves because I really believe that the God that Watchtower serves is not the Almighty, not the Divine, not the All Powerful, not the Creator of the Universe. It's I don't believe for one second that that is the God that they serve, but the God of Watchtower, that the God that they serve, yes, definitely has these humanistic features and that's why they can come up and say well this makes him happy and this displeases him and you know he has to get involved in your personal sex life and how you raise your children and how many hours at work you you do and how much time you spend in the ministry that is a very humanistic god um who meddles in people's lives and that is the God of Watchtower, not the God of the universe. Here's the question. We know Jehovah delights to rescue us, to save us. We know he's moved to do so by his loyal love. But what does it really mean? Does it mean today that when any sort of trial comes our way, that Jehovah is just going to rush in, he's just going to intervene and rescue us every time? No, it does not. It does not mean that. So what will Jehovah do? Well, when we're facing trials, it's true, in some circumstances, Jehovah may remove the trial. But in many other situations, Jehovah may strengthen us so that we'll be able to review the trial, excuse me, endure the trial. Either way, when we feel, when we experience that Jehovah is acting on our behalf, how does it make us feel? We truly, truly rejoice. So again, really interesting. He's saying that um, God, Jehovah, is very selective about who he helps and which trials and problems he will intervene in. Um, and where I stand on that matter is, because when again when I sort of like removed myself from religion I realized that actually it's not God it's not this magical mystical God that is influencing my life so if something good happens I wasn't thinking oh that's God's hand in it that God has caused this or God has blessed me but on the other hand I wasn't thinking well if something doesn't go my way or if something happens or well you know that's the devil you know um influencing that or you know god has left me to you know hasn't intervened i stopped looking at it like that because actually i realized that sometimes if something good has happened it's because i've worked to make it happen i've put myself in that situation um 
so that good things can happen and also you know I've if something bad has happened then I have to go back and think actually you know was that my own doing did I put myself in danger like those the women like the woman and the young girl um walking through that neighborhood if something bad happens to them that's not about God that's not God coming to save them or not saving them it's it's their own fault because they've been they've put themselves in that danger in that situation so you know I kind of grew up in terms of my own thinking and you know in terms of that's not God's influence or lack of influence it's about me and the situation that I've put myself in to. Well now in the following video I want you to take notice of this beautiful experience of a dear sister who did not have the trial removed removed from her but just notice how Jehovah has strengthened her to be able to endure. I was born in Malawi in 1962. I lost my eyesight at two years of age because of an eye disease. We have to rely on the rains for the food we eat and sell as it is our only source of income. I also look after both my parents. My father is 99 years old and my mother is 92 years old. Poverty is very time consuming. There are a lot of household chores to do to keep things clean and neat, like fetching water for our daily needs. In the evening, after we've eaten, this is the time for reading. When I was young, father took the lead in our family worship, which he still does. But now, because of his failing eyesight, I read to them. I read with my fingers, so night time is no problem. My fingers are my eyes. God's kingdom and his sovereignty are first in my life. It is only God's kingdom that will solve all these problems. I feel privileged that I've been able to serve as a regular pioneer for 36 years now. We have the congregation, the ministry, and our brothers and sisters. All these things make me very happy. So, again, I just find it really disturbing, really disturbing how they're twisting their propaganda um, about this selective God. And the first thing is of a lady called Lois who lives in Malawi. So she says that um, she works in the field and she they have to grow crops and they rely on the rain because that is their only source of income. So she has to do what she has to do when the rain comes or in order to prep so that she can make a living so that she could survive her and the family now according to jehovah's witnesses and their guilt tripping propaganda earlier by the standard that the jehovah's witnesses set then lois needs to be working very little hours tending her crop so that she can have food to eat and sell her produce so that she can have money she needs to do as little of that as possible so she can go out in the ministry and um and volunteer her time i just think it's sick it's sick and it's disturbing wasn't that amazing to see that beautiful experience of our sister now jehovah hasn't taken away her trial she's still blind she still has a very limited means but look how jehovah has blessed her Look how she's able to help so many people to come to know about Jehovah. How wonderful. Well, no, Mark Sanderson, I didn't find it amazing. I found it really quite sad. I felt that you and your colleagues in the governing body 
and your Watchtower organisation is exploiting people like Lois, giving her false hope, preying on her. The one thing I noticed is that um, the Kingdom Hall clearly had a lot of funds invested in it. It was really well built. It was a substantial size. It's got, um, you know, a good quality roof and window bars. So, you know, the community has invested in that. Dimamba wanji, nukazindi gila wote. When you looked in the surrounding areas, the properties were poor. A first in my life. Poverty is very time consuming. There are a lot of household chores to do to keep things clean and neat. So that tells me that people have been very much exploited to take their hard earned money to invest in the Kingdom Hall. So no, I don't find it amazing at all. I find it quite exploitative, quite disgusting, really sad um, that Watchtower is preying on people on in communities and especially in poor communities. And it's one thing to prey on people in built up communities with, you know, in, in westernised world, that's one thing. But when you're preying on people in very poor communities in underdeveloped countries, that's very much another thing. I just think it's sick. It's sick and it's disturbing. And you know, I'm really pleased that Joyce and her elderly parents have a faith. I'm really pleased because if they have a faith and a hope to cling to and to get them through the hard times, good for them. But what I find particularly disturbing is the way that Watchtower preys on people like Lois, full of, lulling them into this false sense of security, feeding them lies and m making them and indoctrinating them and making them believe in a false hope. But now let's look at a second video. Now we're going to watch a video where Jehovah really did step in and remove a trial from our dear brother who was in a refugee camp. Let's watch. Because of the civil war, we had to take refuge in a safer part of the country. When we arrived, soldiers took us to internment camps to hold us until they could confirm our identities. In the camps, we lived in tents and it was unbearably hot in them. It was a struggle even to get water. We needed to wait in a queue for four to five hours every day. During the war, our eldest son was killed. It was a big loss for our family. All we could do to cope was pray to Jehovah and find comfort in the Bible. One day, the brothers from the relief committee came and informed us that a regional convention would be held. They had spoken to the camp officials, requesting permission for us to go. For four days, morning and evening, we went to the officials to ask for permission, but they would not tell us if we would be released for the convention. Suddenly, one afternoon, much to our surprise, we were approved to leave the camp for five days. At that time, we had been in the internment camp for months. We had not been allowed to go anywhere. We were so happy that we got the permission to attend the convention. We never expected it. At the time, we had some clothes, but we had nothing for the three-day convention. However, the brothers outside the camp helped us enormously. They were with us, cared for all our needs, so we could be ready for the convention. We still wondered where we were going to stay and how we would get our accommodations. However, when we arrived, the brothers hugged us and warmly welcomed us. We were really encouraged. Even though we faced many challenges and difficulties in the internment camp, that convention was like a nourishing meal for us. 
it was a real joy eating at Jehovah's table. We can never forget those moments. So how wonderful that our amazing God Jehovah helped this dear brother and his family so that they would be able to attend the convention. So by contrast, we have this guy is living with his wife and his younger son in the camps and um, they've been there living in terrible conditions. It's really hot. They're having to wait hours, up to four hours or more just to get water. Um, and they're not able to leave the camp. However, all of a sudden, God decides, you know what? I'm going to intervene in this one. And I'm going to arrange to give these this man and his family um, permission to leave the camp for five days and what do you know it's just around the time of the convention so God doesn't intervene when his son dies he doesn't intervene when they're living in these terrible conditions but yet God will intervene so that they can go to the convention interesting so jehovah will care for them when they want to go to a convention but jehovah doesn't care for them when their son dies or when lois loses her sight as a child he doesn't care for them when they're living in poverty and they haven't got the basics god doesn't care for them then but god only cares when they want to go out preaching or when they want to go to a convention. Mm. A very selective God. The one thing I find with Jehovah's Witnesses and their speakers and the governing body is they talk very much down to people and they talk on a very basic level because these scenarios would excite anybody who's like a child and they have dumbed down their followers of the Jehovah's Witnesses um, and they've dumbed them down so much so that they would find these scenarios really exciting and really believe that yes God really did have his hand in this situation and I find that really disturbing as particularly when I was Jehovah's Witness going along to these conventions I too would have sat there and soaked it all up and thinking, oh yes, isn't Jehovah wonderful? He's, um, you know, helping people in poverty to go out and preach and helping people in internment camps to get to the convention. I too would have thought it was wonderful because we're being spoken to as like we're children and you're never allowed to think broader and wider than what's been presented to you so now that i'm thinking for myself i could look at this situation and think no nah, it's something very wrong very, something very warped and very twisted in the thinking and what they're presenting to us now and i'm sure many of you watching these videos will also think yeah that ain't right. What they're saying and how they're portraying it and what they're wanting us to believe, it isn't right because we're awake now. We can see through it. Gog of Magog, this coalition of nations, is going to lead an all-out attack on Jehovah's servants. Well now, knowing that that attack is coming closer and closer every day. How should we be feeling? Should it make us feel just completely filled with anxiety? Should we be in terror of those events that are coming? Not at all. Uh, please read with me what Jesus said here in Revelation chapter 2. Now, in Revelation 2 and verse 10, Jesus is speaking to anointed Christians in the congregation of Smyrna. Now, notice what he says to them. Do not be afraid of the things that you are about to suffer. Look, the devil will keep on throwing some of you into prison so that you may be fully put to the test and you will have tribulation for 10 days. Prove yourself faithful even to death and I will give you the crown of life. 
Well, now, what do we discern from these words of Jesus? Well, first of all, those who die faithfully and keep their integrity are guaranteed to have salvation from Jehovah. But there's something else that we can discern from these words. It tells us that during these last days, some of Jehovah's servants are going to experience death. In our modern history already, we know our brothers have been thrown into prison. Some have been tortured. And yes, some have even been put to death because of their integrity. So again, reinforcing that he, the Jehovah's Witnesses must expect persecution, trials and tribulation, and even death. They are to expect that and they must remain faithful. Warped, warped and twisted is what comes to mind. So to those brothers and sisters that died because of their faith, my heartfelt sympathy goes out to their families because they died in vain. They died in vain and the governing body has blood on their hands for promoting and indoctrinating and pushing these false hopes on people so that they would even lose their lives. Uh, their families have my deepest sympathy and the governing body, they have blood on their hands. In South Korea alone, over a period of some 70 years, 19,352 of our brothers were imprisoned, and five of those brothers were actually put to death because of their faith. Well, what can we say about those brothers in South Korea and those that died in Nazi Germany and those that died in Eritrea and those that died during the Soviet Union because of their faith? We know that their salvation is completely assured. They are completely safe in the safest place in the universe, the memory of our grand God, Jehovah. Where does it say that their salvation is completely assured? He's saying that they're completely safe, that it's guaranteed. He's not in a position to, to, to make such grand sweeping statements. Nothing is guaranteed. Only God, the God of the Bible, is able to give those guarantees and assurances. There are many examples of where our brothers in the courtroom, during their own trials, have made statements that are similar to what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said to Nebuchadnezzar. I just want to give you one example. This is the statement from Brother Sergei Skrinikov. Uh, that he gave in the courtroom at his own hearing. But then look, look how he ended his statement to the court. Here's what he said. God is one and the same, whether we are free or in prison. Therefore, we are not abandoned. He is with us everywhere as long as we stay faithful to him. Hebrews 13, 6 assures me, Jehovah is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Jehovah, him, Jehovah God himself will help me. Of whom should I be afraid? Well, Brother Skrinikov, this uh, very humble brother, made this powerful statement in the courtroom. What does it show us? Obviously, Jehovah is strengthening his people. He's giving them the power, the courage that they need to be so bold and so frank, even before these powerful authorities. So clearly, um, Jehovah is in courtrooms strengthening criminals or people carrying out potentially criminal acts and wrongdoers. After all, that's why they're there in a courtroom. Um, so God is obviously strengthening them giving them the power and the courage to speak out so boldly to the authorities. So again, 
God is selective when it comes to people suffering, them living in poverty, going blind as a child, when um, families lose loved ones in death. God is selective as to whether he's going to step in and help them. I mean, I wonder if this criminal stood in court was uh, a child abuser and God's coming and strengthening him. I wonder if he was uh, a, a woman beater, if he was violent, if he was drunk in carrying out um, criminal acts because of that. But yeah, no, God has got the time. He's got the time and the power to come and help those people in these situations, to strengthen them and to answer their prayers. But when people really need him, when it comes to prayer, when it comes to poverty and health and people dying, then no, 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 he's too busy for that. Yeah, yeah, walked. What a wonderful time that will be when we experience the salvation of Jehovah. As we have discussed this wonderful topic of Jehovah as our, as our grand savior. Now, whether we face de death with dignity during these last days, or we experience miraculous deliverance at the great tribulation, either way, what can we say? We know that we will have the same outcome. We will all experience the salvation that comes from our God, Jehovah, because if we have that confidence that Jehovah truly is our grand savior, then no matter what calamity, no matter what terror, no matter what trial may come upon us now or in the future, we will be able to continue to rejoice in Jehovah's acts of salvation. So we're almost at the end and um, yeah, they're really reinforcing that the Jehovah is the grand savior. They've not been able to back that up in scripture Nowhere does it say in the Bible that, well, that I'm aware of that Jehovah is the grand saviour. But what I do know is that Jesus is our saviour. And when I was a Jehovah's Witness, we used to even say that at the end of a prayer, through Jesus Christ our saviour. But they've changed that now. I was hearing that they don't um, believe that Jesus is their saviour. Jesus is only the saviour for a few. So, um, yeah, so now they're, they're really reinforcing that Jesus, that Jehovah, they're really reinforcing that Jehovah is the grand saviour. And throughout that whole afternoon session, they only mentioned Jesus once as being saviour. But they've repeatedly mentioned that Jehovah is the grand saviour but then clearly we're talking about different people because they're not talking about the God of the Bible which most Christians wildly accept and acknowledge they're talking about the God of watchtower their idol their idol that they worship that is the God that is their grand saviour. So let's not get that twisted, guys. They're talking about something completely different to what mainstream Christians acknowledge and recognise. So mainstream Christians recognise Jesus as their saviour, but Jehovah's Witnesses and the Watchtower recognise their God, their idol, their God of the Watchtower, as their savior. Thank you, Brother Sanderson, for that scriptural assurance that Jehovah will always act in our behalf. So that brings us to the end, and it's finished off with this guy saying that um, they've now got scriptural assurance that God will always act on their behalf. That's not what I heard. That's not what I heard at all. I was hearing that Jehovah is the grand saviour and as the grand saviour he is selective when it comes to deciding which
people and scenarios and situations he will intervene in. He'll intervene with wrongdoers in court and he'll intervene with wrongdoers in prison. But when it comes to real people who are living their lives, living in poverty with illnesses and life-changing conditions, uh -uh, he's too busy. He ain't going to get involved in that. So guys, that's my review of the Jehovah's Witness Convention. I hope you found that review of interest. If you did, please hit that red subscribe button and the bell and leave me a comment below. Okay guys, so I'm going to review the rest of the convention and I will post those as soon as they're done. Okay guys, thank you for joining me on this video and I look forward to seeing you soon. Take care now. Bye.